Okay, uh, first I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, today I'll talk about non-Hermitian Hamiltonians and low energy scattering in one dimension. This is a um, collaboration with my colleague Perhang Goran from Isfahan University of Technology in Iran. All right, so I will uh, talk about, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I will start with the introduction, very basics on scattering uh, theory in one dimension. I'll explain its dynamical formulation. Then I will show you how this formulation allows you to get the low energy expansion of the transfer matrix and therefore the scattering data. I will introduce the transfer matrix for zero energy Schrodinger equation, which kind of facilitates this calculation of the expansion of the transfer matrix. Then I will generalize the results to scattering on the half line. And finally, I'll uh, briefly give one application of this whole machinery for the study of transmission of scalar waves through a wormhole. Um, so scattering in one dimension is defined in terms of the time independent Schrodinger equation for some potential, which I will consider to be an element of this is space L11. These are functions for which this integral um, is finite and this puts some restriction of how fast this uh, potential needs to decay at infinities. So sigma is some arbitrary um, positive uh, brain number that for different sigmas, we will have different scenarios. And once you take uh, this potential from this L11, when sigma is one, we can show that asymptotically the solutions of the Schrodinger equation are plane waves. That's exactly the solutions for no uh, potential. And uh, there are these uh, coefficients a's and b's in front of the plane wave solutions at plus or minus infinities. And these correspond to right going and left going uh, waves. These are a's are amplitude of the right going waves, b's are the amplitudes of the left going waves. And there is a matrix which connects these A's and B's in terms of this formula here, which is called the transfer matrix, which is the basic tool I will be using. Well, among these general solutions, there are the scattering solutions, the left going um, scattering from the left or left incident uh, waves, where the incident wave comes from minus infinity, partly reflected, partly transmitted. And these are the reflection and transmission amplitudes or you can send the incident wave from plus infinity and then it's partly uh, transmitted and partly uh, reflected. And then this is basic results of the application of the transfer matrix. You use the definition and you show that these reflection and transmission amplitudes are related to the entries of the transfer matrix. Therefore, once you calculate the transfer matrix, you know the reflection and transmission amplitudes for your potential. And that is the aim of solving a scattering problem in one dimension. In particular, left and right transmission amplitudes turns out to co coincide and this is called reciprocity in transmission. Well, uh, this transfer matrix has a basic uh, property called the composition property, which says that if you have a potential V, which you can split as the sum of two potentials with disjoint supports. So one of them vanishes up to x equal to a and the other one vanishes afterwards. And if you add these two, you get the potential. Here I plotted the absolute value of the potential and these potentials can be complex. Then you can show that the transfer matrix for these constituent potentials v1 and v2 give you the potential for the sum according to this formula where this order of this matrix multiplication is important, has to do with the locations of the supports of V1 and V2. When the support of V2 is to the right of the potential of V1, then M2 comes before M1 in this product. Uh, many years ago, I noticed that this is very similar to the way you compose evolution operators in quantum mechanics. Remember that uh, if you have a state vector in a Hilbert space for a quantum system, you can write the evolution in time in terms of this time evolution operator. And if you uh, want to evolve 
state vector from time t0 to time t2, you can first evolve to intermediate time t1 and then from t1 to t2. And therefore the evolution operators associated for these uh, evolutions are related by this composition uh, property, which is almost identical with the way uh, transfer matrices uh, compose. So this uh, kind of was the motivation for me to seek for quantum systems whose evolution operators will give the, well, the, the transfer matrix for uh, the given uh, scattering potential uh, of interest. Just to remind you that when you have a general time independent Hamiltonian, the evolution operator satisfies this uh, Schrodinger equation, T0 is an initial time. Obviously, t uh, when you don't evolve, you get identity operator uh, and you can write the, the Schrodinger equation as an integral equation, and then you can repeatedly use um, this equation to calculate uh, the use that appear on its right-hand side. And this gives you what is known as the Dyson series for the evolution operator. And you identify this with the time ordered exponential of this integral of the Hamiltonian. This is a formal solution that gives you some series that you usually try to calculate using perturbation theory or other means. This is, holds for arbitrary uh, quantum systems. Now I want to introduce a quantum system for a given scattering problem. Uh, I introduced two level uh, states, uh, two component states, which are constructed out of the solution of the Schrodinger equation and the first derivative times some uh, two by two invertible matrix that I will not that I will choose later. And then I introduce this two by two matrix, which involves the potential. Then you can show that the time independent Schrodinger equation is equivalent to the time dependent Schrodinger equation for this Hamiltonian matrix. This is a two by two matrix obtained from this G, which is arbitrary. The only requirement that is that it's an invertible X dependent matrix and this V, which is fixed by the potential. Now, if you choose this G to have this particular form, then you can show that this two component states, this capital size, tend to constant values when you take X to plus or minus infinity. And furthermore, if you take this G and substitute in this formula for H, you get a very, very simple form for this Hamiltonian matrix. Now the first equation tells you that capital Psi at plus infinity can be written as the transfer matrix times or acting on the Psi at minus infinity. That's just the definition of the transfer matrix. And you see, if you consider X as evolution parameter, because X appears here, then this M has to do with the evolution operator, which takes plus infinity, uh, states from minus infinity in, in X to plus infinity in X. And this leads to this uh, statement, the transfer matrix for the potential for a given potential V is equal to the evolution operator from minus infinity to plus infinity of this Hamiltonian. But again, this X, which is the space variable in scattering theory, plays the role of time in this effective uh, evolution of this quantum mechanical system. This is a two level system, by the way, as you see. And again, you can write this uh, U and therefore the transfer matrix as time ordered exponential of this Hamiltonian, which admits this particular Dyson series. Uh, this Hamiltonian, it's very easy to see that it is not emission. If you are interested in the standard quantum mechanics where the potential is real valued, then you can show that this Hamiltonian satisfies this relation which is the defining relation for pseudo-Hermitian operators. So H becomes pseudo-Hermitian with the pseudo-metric being third Pauli matrix. If V is not 
real valued. If it's complex valued, then you can show that this H commutes with its pseudo adjoint, where pseudo adjoint is uh, hold on a second, uh, defined in terms of this formula. This is the adjoint with respect to the pseudo metric sigma three. So you see, even in standard quantum mechanics, where you have evolutions which are unitary, the scattering problem leads to pseudo Hermitian Hamiltonians in this formulation. Now, let's make the K dependent of all these quantities explicit. So I introduce a K to make sure you understand that everything, everything depends on K. This is obvious because you see K appears in the, dis, the, the, the definition of H and obviously uh, reflection transmission uh, coefficients and the evolution uh, and the transfer matrix are all functions of K and the aim of solving a scattering, scattering problem is to determine the K dependence of these quantities. Now, first I will consider the case that the potential is, uh, has a finite range that has, means that it's, it has compact support and take the support to be an interval from given here, X minus to X plus. So the potential vanishes outside. And even the potential vanishes, you see the Hamiltonian will vanish and there will be no evolution. And that says that the transfer matrix uh, will, in, will be given by this formula where this integral, the time ordered exponential uh, goes, uh, the integral uh, is taken from X minus to X plus because outside this interval, there is no evolution because Hamiltonian is zero. Um, now what the aim of low energy scattering is to determine the behavior of the scattering data, that means reflection and transmission amplitudes, when k is a small, that's the k going to zero limit. This is an old problem, which is, was studied by mathematicians for decades. In 1985, there's this paper by Paul et al, where they consider this problem and obtain a rather general solution for potentials which are exponentially decaying, and in particular, the uh, potentials which have finite range. And this is like 32 pages long paper in the Journal of Operator Theory, which is almost impossible to penetrate. They use all sorts of different results from operator theory and function analysis. And for a physicist, it's almost impossible to understand what they do. They give some um, iterative, uh, method for computing the uh, coefficients of the expansions of reflection and transmission amplitudes in powers of k. Uh, the encountered this problem for uh, the purpose of solving a physics problem related to wormholes that at the end of the talk I'll try to briefly talk about. And we couldn't make use of these formulas of this. So we thought we will use this dynamical formulation of scattering theory to compute these coefficients ourselves. And this is the main topic of this course where I can try to outline how you can do this without use of much mathematics, right? Calculus and differential equations is sufficient. And the basic idea is that when you look at these equations that I gave you, this is the definition of the time evolution operator for this Hamiltonian, obviously, uh, u x, one, x minus x minus is one because there's no evolution here. And if I take the evolution from x minus to x plus, that gives me the transfer matrix. And you see the K dependence of H is very simple. There's a one over K in front of H and the rest is just exponentials. And these are essentially trigonometric functions. They are analytic functions. So that essentially tells you that you should be able to use these formulas just expand everywhere these k's uh, and try to match the coefficients of both sides of the series. But obviously that it's not that simple because you're multiplying these two. Uh... Yes, is there a question? Okay, so it's not that easy because your multiple, these are matrices, you have to expand them and then you multiply two matrices which are power series and can, things can get very complicated. 
But there are structures that you can use, and I'll try to briefly uh, outline how we did this, which led to a solution. First, you introduce these matrices, gamma, delta, and k. Uh, k. They're very simple matrices, as you see. And then um, uh, you define this D and G by multiplying the evolution operator from the left by I times delta and K times this gamma. So these are two by two matrices. And it turns out that this K um, and gamma and delta satisfy this identity here. This particular sum of the products of these matrices, this T means transpose, gives you one. So if I just take U and multiply by one and write one in terms of this, like I get this, inf this formula, and this allows me to write U as K times this G matrix times minus I K, K transport, transpose D matrix. You might say, so what am I, what, why do we do this? You'll see in a minute why. So this is what you get. You have now an expression for U, which has this form. This U satisfies this time dependent Schrodinger equation for this Hamiltonian matrix. And when you substitute here, you get a pair of uh, equations. They decouple. And I mean, you can write this equation, which is the matrix equation, as just two equations. Uh, for D and G, which they mix, they don't seem to get decoupled, but the coefficients that I have uh, marked by red, this S, C, and D, turn out to be even functions. And this is very handy because it allows you to divide these series into even part and odd part, and then try to solve for uh, this D and G. So, Another observation which you can make from using the second and third equations here is that this U is probably have this kind of expansion in K. This is supported by the mathematicians' results, uh, although it's difficult from uh, the, their uh, formulas to see, but can be derived from there that this U has an expansion in K, which is a, a kind of Lorentz series expansion with k equal to zero being possibly a pole. It starts from minus one. If the coefficient of the minus one term is non-zero, that's a pole and the rest becomes a, the rest is just the analytic function. So from this, you can derive these expansions for D and G because D and G are related to you by just this constant matrices which don't involve k. And once uh, you impose the boundary condition on U at initial time, which is X minus here, you see that this DM and GM, which are the coefficients of these expansions at X equal to X minus, they just are proportional to delta and gamma when M is zero, otherwise uh, they are zero. So this way you have two equations for D and G. You have these expansions, you just substitute here and you use the fact that this SCD are even functions and that these coefficients are supposed to satisfy these boundary conditions at x equal to x minus to actually determine the coefficients dm and dg iteratively. The technical details are given in this uh, preprint, which is on the web uh, in archive. And I don't want to spend any time on explaining how you get through all this calculation. It's not very difficult, but there are amazing cancellations and nice things which happen because of this choice of the splitting introduction of D and G. So once you get the coefficients for D and G, you have the coefficients for U. And remember the transfer matrix is obtained from U. And this is the expression we obtained uh, up to power of k squared. So there is this one over k term. The red terms here are the constant k to the zero term. Then this is the linear term in k, which we could compute up to this. But you can do it arbitrarily. It just becomes more messy as you go along. 
and all the previous papers published on this topic could compute up to the zeroth order term. So the first order term is new. There is this L here, which we introduced as to keep track of dimensions. This is an arbitrary length scale, which is which you can choose out of the information from your physical system or to choose it arbitrarily, it doesn't matter. But it turns out that these coefficients, which appear here, phi minus, uh, phi one, phi two, uh, this G here, uh, these are related to solutions of zero energy Schrodinger equation, this one. And phi one and phi two are the solutions with these uh, initial conditions. Remember X minus is the initial point on the X axis where the support begins. So, in principle, if you can solve the zero energy Schrodinger equation, then you can get this phi one and phi two. And then this G, which appears here, can be obtained using this formula. This curly G is a Green's function for phi one and phi two. It's uh, just has constants in front for uh, keeping, keeping everything dimensionless. And this zeta involves again phi one and uh, the integral which involves V. And there are powers of X squared here and X cubed inside the integral. So this is this why, what makes the rate of um, decay of V important. If V doesn't decay fast enough, then these can blow up. For finite range, everything is finite. So there's no worry. If it's exponentially decaying, um, potential. Again, there is no worry because all the things which multiply V are polynomials. So the integrals always converge. And that's why this is done for exponentially decaying potentials by mathematicians uh, to start with. But we have now a very simple, looks complicated, but really it's not. If you compare with the content of this mathematician's uh, papers. For you, and then you just put x equals x plus, and that gets you the transfer matrix. From the transfer matrix, uh, as I mentioned, you can easily generalize this to exponentially decaying potentials by taking the limit of x going x plus minus going to x uh, plus or minus infinity. Exponential, this is the definition of exponentially decaying potential. If you if x becomes large, this is dominated by an exponential, decaying exponential. And once you take this limit, then you have to rewrite the definition of phi one and phi two to be able to use this formula. And what happens is that X minus becomes limit of X going to minus infinity. And uh, in the initial conditions, they become asymptotic uh, defining conditions. And you can show that such solutions exist for exponentially decaying potentials. Actually, they exist for more less rapidly decaying potentials as well. So with that, you, we have this expansion, low energy expansion for the transfer matrix, but these coefficients, A's and B's, and this G1, given in terms of the asymptotic values when X goes to plus infinity of phi one and phi two. Again, this, the formula for G, zeta, and this curly G are the same as before, except that I have sent X minus to minus infinity and X plus to plus infinity. And I mentioned again, that when V is exponentially decaying potential, all these integrals uh, exist and they have limits when X goes to plus infinity. Once we have the expansion for the transfer matrix, we can use this formulas to get the expansion for the reflection and transmission amplitudes. And here uh, they are. It turns out that the form of the expansion for reflection and transmission amplitudes are different in terms for these two cases. Then B1, which is the, essentially the limit of the derivative of phi one when X goes to plus infinity is not equal to zero. And when B1 is equal to zero, we have completely different features in the low energy. And this is what mathematicians call 
a zero energy resonance. Our method actually gives you a very simple uh, formula for zero energy resonances. If your potential uh, is, has, is such that this V1, you compute this V1, and if the V1 is zero, then you have a zero energy uh, resonance. And that means that just by change, I mean, just look at how different the R to the L is in the, these two cases. So if you change the parameters of your potential smoothly so that it goes through B1 equal to zero, then there is a sudden change in the uh, behavior of reflection and transmission amplitudes. Um, the generalization of this low energy scattering for uh, potentials, which are not exponentially decaying, but lie in this L1 sigma set when sigma is bigger than or equal to uh, one, is all, has also been studied by uh, Roger Newton and Octo, Sun, and Klaus in 2001. And what one can say is that, uh, first of all, as soon as sigma becomes one or larger, this transfer matrix of ours becomes continuous. It's analytic um, on the upper half plane, upper half K plane, and it's continuous on the uh, real axis in the K plane, except possibly at zero. And once it becomes, if the sigma becomes two times M plus epsilon, epsilon less than one, then you have an expansion, which is a kind of polynomial and then something which doesn't need to be a polynomial, but it's dominated by K to the N minus one plus epsilon. So this is like something like square root or a cubic root, which is not differentiable at K equal to zero, but still it goes fast enough, faster than um, this power of K to zero. And the nice thing about our formalism or the, 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 the discussion of the exponential decaying potentials is that these coefficients which come determine the polynomial part can be obtained from our method. So what happens is that suppose our potential is not exponentially decaying, but we just enforce and compute our uh, coefficients. What happens is that as soon as the coefficients are uh, finite, they are here, they, they give you this piece. And once one of the coefficients blow up, that means that you have to stop and the rest is just a small, but not analytic piece. So in that case, this is also very uh, useful for cases where the potential is not exponentially decaying, but decays fast enough so that it's one of these uh, potentials belonging from these classes. So this is the basic formula that we have obtained. Now, as you see, everything depends on the solutions of this zero energy Schrodinger equation. Um, when the potential is L11, this is the slowest decaying condition for which this uh, low energy scattering uh, has the standard uh, results. Um, then we know that phi1 and phi2 exists um, and they do satisfy this asymptotic boundary conditions. And what I did was what we did was to in, try to introduce a transfer matrix which connects these constants. So the solutions always tend to constant values for phi prime and phi minus x phi prime when x goes to plus or minus infinity. This is actually not very difficult to see why, because suppose v is zero, then phi is just a polynomial of degree one. So its derivative will be constant. And this combination, phi minus x phi prime will also be constant. So this says, if the potential decays like this, then asymptotically, the solution is like the solution of the case that v is zero. So there, there are these constants, v's and a's for which phi, my, phi prime and phi minus x phi prime tend to. And I'm introducing a new transfer matrix which connects these asymptotic uh, values of phi prime and phi minus x phi prime. And it turns out that using the following the same approach I pursued to get the um, time uh, the, the time dependent formulation 
of transfer matrix, dynamical formation of transfer matrix, I can repeat that and I can identify this new transfer matrix with the time evolution operator of a new Hamiltonian, which involves Xs here. Now, again, this Hamiltonian turns out to be pseudonormal with an X-dependent uh, pseudometric. And then the potential is real. I times this Hamiltonian becomes pseudo-Hermitian. Again, X-dependent uh, eta. Remember, X plays the role of time here. So this is also an interesting situation where these pseudo Hermitian uh, Hamiltonians appear. And once you make use of the fact that this M zero is related to some evolution operator, this functions that you need for the purpose of getting coefficients of the low energy expansion of your scattering data can be written as in terms of the matrix entries of this matrix U0, according to these formulas. Again, L here is a length scale that is arbitrary. Um, a corollary of this uh, construction or this theorem that I've written here is that we have found a very nice uh, representation of the condition for the existence of zero energy resonances. It is a, a zero energy resonance appears if and only if the M21 entry of this transfer matrix is zero. That's proportional to B1 that I discussed. Okay, this completes the discussion of low energy uh, expansion in the full line. Now I wanna quickly talk about the half line. So this time X runs from zero to positive infinity. I have the Schrodinger equation. I have a potential which belongs to the same class. And now the scattering uh, problem becomes well-defined if you give a boundary condition at X equal to zero. This is a very general uh, Robin type boundary condition that alpha and beta are not both zero. If beta equal to zero, you have the Dirichlet boundary condition. For alpha equal to zero, you have the Neumann boundary condition. But in general, you have a mixed Robin boundary conditions at zero. So it's quite general. And I have also made the coefficients alpha and beta k dependent, which is becomes very, very com uh, general. And um, if the potential belongs to this so-called FADA class, then when X goes to pol positive infinity, as before, it's just a linear combination of plane waves. And A plus and uh, B plus can be identified with the amplitude of the reflected and incident waves. So the ratio becomes the reflection amplitude and the aim here is to get this reflection amplitude. So um, this is just our collected what I just said. Now I want to relate this scattering problem in half line to the full line. For that, I extend my potential. I take it to be uh, zero in the negative half line and the previous potential on the positive one and consider the uh, scattering problem on the full line defined by this V. Well, certainly because potential vanishes for negative values of Z, it's just in the, in the negative half line. It's just a linear combination of plane waves. And then at X equals to minus infinity, I get the same formula here. And for X positive infinity, I have that. So the transfer matrix M of this new extended uh, potential connects a plus B plus to A minus B minus as before. And using this method, if I can arrange A minus B minus so that this boundary condition that's here is satisfied, which I can always do because I have the very uh, explicit formula for psi for x less than or equal to zero. So I can choose a minus and b minus so that this boundary condition is satisfied. Then I can use the transfer matrix M for relating 
uh, A plus and B plus using this formula, just divide the, new, the first row by the second row and the both on side to get the reflection amplitude. Here, gamma is, re is related to alpha and beta using this formula. So what's the benefit of this? And now you see that you can use all the nice properties of transfer matrix in the full line to deal with problems in the half line. And in particular, we can get the low energy expansion of this reflection amplitude in the half line. Because I have very little time, I don't want to go through this. It turns out that this is the expansions we get using this method and there is a zero energy resonance when B2 becomes zero and when you have Dirichlet really boundary conditions. For the other case, you don't have zero energy. So let me uh, try in the few minutes that I have, uh, talk about wormhole scattering. This is the um, metric uh, written down as uh, proper time square in terms of a functions P and Q. This R theta phi are spherical coordinates and this is the generic matrix which defines um, spherically symmetric wormholes. Um, you can introduce a global coordinate X which is related to the radial um, coordinate in such a way that this term becomes dx squared. So the metric uh, takes this form and you want this wormhole to have asymptotically flat feature. And that means that the radi this dependence of R on X is uh, of this form, this X takes negative or positive values. And this picture will be helpful to uh, understand that what this X means. X is a coefficient, is a coordinate, it's a global coordinate. It goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. For the negative values, you're in one part of the universe. For positive values of X, you're on the other part of the universe. R is the distance from the center in both universes. Um, and the, the typical, the most uh, probably no, well-known example is the so-called Ellis wormhole when this R has this particular X dependence and it gives you a shape like this if you reduce in to, to, to one plus one dimensions. So we want to do scattering of a scalar field. So this is the Klein-Gordon uh, field in uh, this is space time. For the cases that this P function is one, you can get uh, a very simple time harmonic solution where Vs are uh, uh, spherical harmonics and this Psi satisfies the time dependent Schrodinger equation in one dimension for with this potential. The potential is given by this R, which is not fixed, and K is given by this formula, which is this omega is the frequent angular frequency, angular frequency, M is the mass of the field. And because we want to uh, have uh, stability of the wormhole, we are only interested in low energy waves because high energy waves will contradict the st stability. We, Think of wormholes which can be very small and very unstable if they are encounter high energy waves. And you can show that because of the, this uh, form of this R, which doesn't get zero, it becomes the, the, there's a smallest possible value of R, the first term here acts like a barrier potential when L is not zero. And so if you are interested in low energy waves, the first term essentially blocks the wave. So you can get scattering from one part of the universe to the other part of the universe only when L is equal to zero. That means spherical waves. And then the potential becomes just R double prime over R and you need to solve a low energy scattering problem for this potential. Now, under this condition on this function R, which is quite general, all the known examples that we checked satisfy this. So asymptotically, we know it should be like plus minus X. We could add some constants here and the rest goes to zero when X goes to infinity. Epsilon is some arbitrary positive number, can be small, but this is like analytic in one over X. And with this condition, you can make sure that this potential be 
belongs to L12. Our method gives you this formula for the transfer matrix. So you can get these two coefficients, the last one blows up, but there is a function here, which is going to zero faster than a constant. And we can get this M minus and M zero if we know this phi one and phi two. How do we get phi one and phi two? In this case, it's amazingly simple. Why? Because potential is already R double prime over R. So this function R itself is a solution of the zero energy Schrodinger equation. This is second order homogeneous equation. We've got one solution. The other solution we can get, we get both solutions, the general solution we have. And out of that, we get phi one and phi two. And here is the formulas for the reflection and transmission amplitudes. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, it's already over, but uh, how much? Okay. Can you, yeah. Uh, well, just two slides left. Okay. So, from the transmission amplitude. Hello. So, from the transmission amplitude here, you see there is this S, which is given here, and this C plus one were those constants that I introduced. They enter in this trans transmission amplitude. So, what does transmission uh, tell us? So, if you send some wave from lower half of the wormhole, the transmission says some part of it is transmitted to the other part. So if the observer is in the lower half, it will see that there is an object in the sky which absorbs the wave. And you can get the absorption coefficient out of this transmission amplitude using this formula. Now we showed that gener for generic wormholes with p equals to one, these are called super static wormholes, the cross-section, the absorption cross-section is equal to this area of the truth of the wormhole times a term which goes to zero faster than linear. Now, people have in old times calculated the, the absorption cross-section for black holes. And then you see that for massless scalar fields, it has area of the event horizon plus corrections of order K. We don't have corrections of order K. So this can be used to differentiate a wormhole from a black hole. And for massive scalar fields, much more important here is just the constant plus uh, terms which decay for low energy. Here you have one over K squared. So there's a singularity. So using but this results, you can differentiate between uh, a wormhole from a black hole. So this is my conclusions. I talked about dynamical formulation of scattering uh, theory, which involves non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, even for real potentials. This formalism extends to higher dimensions. We have generalized to electromagnetic waves. I have given some talks on this in other uh, conferences. We used this formalism in one dimension to treat low energy expansion. We developed a transfer matrix for zero energy uh, Schrodinger equation. And finally, I could just give you an application for transmission of scalar waves through a wormhole. These are the references and I will finish by thanking you for attending my talk. Okay, uh, thank you Ali for your nice talk. Uh, okay, maybe we can take one question, uh, quick question if, is there any question? Okay, so it seems there is no question. So let's thank uh, Ali again for his talk. And